Welcome everyone to the January celebration of Mind Talk. Today, we are fortunate to have Susan Goldstein from St. Mary's College of Maryland, and she's going to be giving a wonderful talk sort of at the intersection of math and art, uh, starting with one of the most famous theorems in mathematics, the four color theorem. So I'm really looking forward to this and I think you'll all enjoy it. Today, I'm gonna to be speaking about my favorite parts of math, which are the history and the art. Um, so let me go ahead and start with the history. Uh, as Bob was saying, um, the things that I'm gonna be showing you are connected to the four color theorem. Um, and the four color theorem was originally proposed um, in 1852 uh, by Francis Guthrie, who basically was coloring in a map of England and started to sort of think about how many colors he was using, right? So if you're coloring in a map where there are a bunch of regions marked, usually the reason why you're coloring it is to make the regions distinct. So for the coloring to be useful, you want regions that neighbor each other to be different colors. And so the question that Francis Guthrie asked was, well, how many colors does it take? Um, and it seemed to him that uh, the number looked like it might be four, right? Four seemed to be working. Now I'll point out that certainly there are maps that require fewer than four colors, right? But if you wanna be able to cover color all possible maps, then you absolutely need to have four colors at your disposal. Um, and let me give you a real world illustration. Um, I actually tried Maryland first, but it turns out that the geometry isn't quite so interesting. So I grew up in Pennsylvania um, and this is a county map of Pennsylvania. The four color conjecture was this idea that to color in a map, um, you would never need more than four colors. And so the illustration that you need four colors um, again, this is the state that I grew up in. So I grew up in Pennsylvania. This is a county map. And if you zoom in on the appropriate part of the county map, uh, like Homing, Columbia, Northumberland, and Montour counties all touch each other, right? So that's a, an assemblage of four counties where you're definitely going to need to have a separate color for each one. So you know that if you wanna be able to get all of the possible maps that you can draw, you're going to need to have four colors at your disposal. Right, and that's fairly easy to show. So the question was, are four colors always going to be enough? So Francis Guthrie poses this question and two years later it is first published, but it's slightly confusingly published by FG. Um, and, and what makes this a little bit confusing is that Francis has a brother, Frederick Guthrie. And so it's not entirely clear which of them published it. It happened that they were both students of Augustus de Morgan. You know, early in this, they had brought the question to de Morgan's attention. And so de Morgan, who was substantially more famous and therefore garnered more attention, um, published the problem in 1860. And so by that time, a lot of people had heard about the question and it was an interesting one that was easy to state. And so people started working on it. Um, and you know, you work at something, uh, sometimes you get lucky. So as it happens, they didn't have to wait that long because in 1879, Alfred Kemp proved the four color theorem, which is great, right? Really short history, okay, good, we're done. Um, and so this is one of my favorite examples from math history of the challenge of determining that something's been proven because it took 11 full years for anyone to realize that Kemp's proof didn't work. And it's a shame because it's a really nice proof. It actually uses some very clever ideas they just happen to break down in important cases. So in 1890, Percy Haywood publishes a paper uh, in which he says, yeah, the chem proof doesn't actually work, sorry. And he wasn't able to fix it either. So he wasn't able to prove the four color theorem. But what he did manage to pull off was that he proved the five color theorem. So what he proved was five colors are definitely enough. If you have five colors, you can color any map that you want, everything's gonna be great, right? Um, and then for an agonizingly long period of time, this is where our knowledge stood. So all we knew was five colors are enough, four colors are needed, but where is it? Are there maps that require five colors or can you actually do all of them in four? Um, it turns out to be quite hard. So people churned away on this for uh, the better part of a century, um, until fiddlingly enough for the, the current assembly, uh, there was an amazing breakthrough that, that was published by uh, Martin Gardner, in fact, uh, in, in, in his famous column. Um, he announced this amazing result that it turned out that you actually need five colors. Wow. And so 
in his column, he showed this particular map that had this feature that you needed five colors to color it, which surprised everyone and had a lot of people frantically trying to color it. And it's really, really hard to color. And a bunch of people wrote in to complain that, would no, no, I could do it. Look, see, this four color thing worked um, because they hadn't noticed that this was the column for April of that year. Um, so this was part of a now infamous April Fool's column that uh, Martin Gardner put out about uh, six of the biggest advances in mathematics the previous year, um, which were all fake. Um, and that was one of them. Lucky for him, he was, he was pretty close to the end of the point where you could reasonably pull that off without too much suspicion. Because in 1976, a proof of the four color theorem was announced but I sort of pause over proof because that was one of the questions was, well, does this really count as a proof? So what had happened was in the intervening decades, Heche had been working on these methods to allow you to come up with a proof by basically an exhaustive computer search of cases. So the idea was, suppose that there was a map that needed five colors. If there is, then you can show that there are certain like sort of minimal type sub maps that you have to have. And so if you can knock off all of the possible sub maps where this could fail and show that you can four color all of them, then you'd have a proof. And that's something that you could get a computer to do. And so uh, in 1976, Apple and Hacken announced that they had actually done this, that they had come up with a computer assisted proof that was totally unreadable. <laughs> And so this was, this was kind of a big deal at the time. It was the first point at which a major result had a proof announced that was not human readable, which raised some really serious questions about, does that count? Like, is that what a proof is supposed to be? Um, also, in the years afterwards, there were some mutterings that it looked like there might be some gaps or mistakes in the proof. And actually it sort of turned out that they were. So in fact, the proof that was announced wasn't quite ready for prime time. Um, and so it seems like it takes about, you know, average 12 years for people to work out gaps in a, in a, in a proof, you know, either recognize that they're irreconcilable or fix them. But in 1989, Apple and Hacken published a um, corrected proof. It was all double checked by hand, but it was still not anything that sort of cast any insight into the question. Um, and so even at the point where we are now, where people mostly accept that, yeah, okay, no, this was a proof, and we really do know that the four color theorem is true, it, it's a very disappointing kind of proof, right? I mean, the initial idea that allows you to reduce it to a finite number of cases, there's some nice stuff in there, but the proof itself doesn't really give you any insight into why the number should be four, it just sort of is. So in 1996, uh, Robertson, Sanders, Seymour, and Thomas um, came up with a more efficient algorithm for a computer to uh, four color a map and uh, you know, found other efficiencies in the argument. So they managed to reduce the complexity of the proof. Uh, the original proof was uh, a little over 1800 cases uh, that the computer had to check. And uh, as of 1996, it was down to uh, under 700. Um, but yeah, there's still no human readable proof. There's just been, there have been improvements in how easy it is to check the code and how efficient the proofs are. That being said, I would like to go back to um, that, the question of how we know that four colors are needed. Um, and in order to understand that a little bit better, I, I wanna look a little bit more closely at the kind of maps we're talking about here, right? So we're talking about maps where you divide uh, you know, typical map would be the plane, the most common ones that you have. You define the pl plane into regions. So you're gonna have a bunch of, they might be countries, they might be counties, they might be states that are divided from each other. And those are what you're coloring in. Um, now I will point out, cause it's sort of useful conceptually, you can do this on the plane, but just like on earth, um, you can actually also do this on a sphere. It turns out that for coloring purposes, whether you're looking at a map that's flat or you're looking at a map that's on a globe, it doesn't really make a difference for coloring. In fact, if you have a map on a globe, you can think of it as if the globe were a balloon and you can just kind of puncture it and stretch it out and lay it flat. Um, and so it's useful to think of it both of those ways. Um, so a map is gonna define, divide either the plane or a sphere into regions. And those regions are also sometimes called faces. So for reasons coming up, I will, I will tend to use the word faces. So for example, I have drawn a little very simple map here. Um, and this is a map 
that divides the plane into how many regions? Well, there's an important part about this. I really want to count all of the plane. So when we're counting the different faces that we're dividing this into, we want to make sure that we count the outside of whatever our cluster of countries is. And that lines up with the fact that if you were thinking of this as being a map on a globe, then there's sort of no inside or outside. It's just, you know, this would be five blobs that are, are all around each other. So here we've got five faces in this, this particular map. Um, and those faces are divided by the lines that are separating them. And we can sort of break down the structure of that um, a little bit more precisely. Um, we can think of these uh, curves that connect them as forming a network of uh, edges. And so in this case, I want to count as a single edge something that separates two and only two countries. Right? So for example, the orange arc that I have marked here, that would be an edge. It goes from one place where three countries intersect to another place where three countries intersect. And that's what typically happens. It's most common that three countries will intersect as a, at a corner, but for what it's worth, you could have four countries intersect or five countries intersect at a vertex. Um, countries that only intersect at a vertex are not counted as touching for the coloring. That's important because otherwise you could take a pie and cut it into like 17 pieces and then you need 17 colors, right? Um, and so the uh, different faces that we have here are bounded by edges and vertices because vertex is one of those words that has a weird Greek plural. Um, and, and so we can go ahead and count those too. So if, if we count up on this particular map, if you count up all of the edges and you're careful to always count them as going from one vertex to another, and, and not accidentally stick two of them together, um, you'll find that there are nine edges here. Um, and then the vertices, there turn out to be six of them. What I'm gonna do with these is something that you're either expecting me to do, or it's gonna look really weird, depending on whether you've seen this before. But um, it turns out to be interesting to compute if F is the number of faces and E is the number of edges and V is the number of vertices, to compute V minus E plus F, right? Which by the way, is the same as F minus E plus V. Um, and I don't know why it is that it makes sense to me to list them in one order when I'm counting them in the other order when I'm combining them. But V minus E plus F is the common order for the formula. It kind of goes up in dimension, right? So zero dimensional points, one dimensional edges, two dimensional faces. And if you take V minus E plus F for this particular map, you find that you get two is the answer. Why would you want to do this? Well, because an interesting pattern emerges. If you look at a bunch of maps, and just to make it easier, I just took like sub maps of the map that I started, so I didn't have to draw a whole bunch of other things. But I would invite you, particularly if you haven't seen this before, to draw a bunch of other maps with countries. Um, a side note, if you're doing that, you do need to make sure that you count all the regions. You don't have sort of like separate things. We'll talk about that more later. Um, so you want to make a, a single connected clump of countries and then the outside as your outside region. But if you do that, um, you'll find that when you compute V minus E plus F, it looks like you always get two. I would invite you, in fact, if you haven't seen this before, to think about if you can convince yourself that that's true. Um, maybe think about taking a map and comparing it to simpler versions of the same map. Um, but yeah, that turns out to be the case. If you have any one of these maps, um, then um, this is Euler's formula, not to be confused with Euler's formula or Euler's formula. Um, I, I, there's actually only one other one that I know of off the top of my head, but I wouldn't be shocked if there were several more. Um, it, you get V minus E plus F is equal to two. And so the reason why I wanna talk about this a little bit is because I obviously can't prove the four pillar theorem for you, right? No one can, it's not human readable. But I'd like to give you at least a little bit of an idea of how you would even begin to do a proof like this. Because it's a tall order, right? How do you sort of try to say general things about every possible map you could ever draw? Um, and so just to give you a little bit of insight into that, um, now is the point at which I'd like to return to the question of why you know that you need four colors. And I want to look at a, a simplified version of the, the county map that I showed you. So instead of using actual counties, this is now just a, a, a stylized map. Um, I, I didn't want to fill the whole slide because it's just sort of confusing, but the yellow is sort of the rest of the plane, right? And then you have these um, orange, purple, and green regions. 
each of which is a triangle. Um, and for what it's worth, I'd argue that the yellow is, it's kind of also a triangle too, because it's an area that's bounded by three sides, right? Well, if you don't like that, you can always look at this on a, on a sphere. And one thing that's sort of handy, if you're the sort of person who does a lot of like fiber arts mathematical models is, um, it's actually not that hard to create triangular countries. Um, so this is a bunch of um, what are almost granny squares. They're just missing a corner. So these are four granny triangles that are stitched together. And so when they're stitched together, you get something that would be a sphere if it weren't for the fact that I sort of cuff the triangles in because it's a little bit easier to see that way. So this is the kind of globe version of the map that's on the slide. This is one where you can you can take it and literally count the faces and the edges. I want to try and think about how to do it abstractly. Let's say we didn't have this model or we didn't have the picture. We just knew that we had a map where we're planning to take four countries and we want each of them to touch all of the others and we want to put them together. And because we know we have four countries total, we know that each country has to touch three other countries. So we know that each one should be bounded by three edges. So they're going to be a triangle of some sort. I mean, maybe the edges won't be straight lines, but, but we're basically taking four triangles and sticking them together. And so we can think about, well, what would the face, edge, and vertex counts be based on that? Right, the faces is pretty clear. They're going to be four faces. The edges, like I said, you could count them in the in the map. But if we don't have the map to look at, if we just have the triangles, well, before we put the triangles together, there are a total of twelve edges. Right, three for each of the four triangles. So we've got twelve edges to work with. But each edge after we pass and everything together is between two different regions. So we're we're counting them all twice. So the total number of edges should be exactly half the number of edges in all of the triangles added together. So that's telling us that the number of edges should be 12 divided by two, which is six, right? And either if you happen to know a lot about, let's say tetrahedra, which is what this actual shape is that's crocheted here, um, or if you want to count it on the, on the picture on the slide, you can see, yep, indeed there are 12 edges. Sorry, there are six edges. And this does require a little bit more information. You sort of have to look at this. There are three triangles at each corner, right? You might not know that there are three triangles to a vertex as you go in. I will point out, you definitely know that there have to be at least three triangles at a vertex. Because if only two countries are coming together, then you're not at a vertex. You're still in the middle of an edge. But in this case, we know there are actually three triangles at each vertex. And so um, we can tell that the total number of vertices is going to be, well, four triangles, three vertices each, so that's 12. But now each one is getting counted three times, so the total number of vertices is uh, 12 divided by three, which is four, right? And sure enough, here we have one, two, three, and four vertices. And so if we compute the V minus E plus F for this, um, good, we get two. I want now to think through what would happen if we tried to make a map with five countries, each of which touch all the others. Now. Meta reasoning tells us that you can't do that because if you could do that, then you would have to use five different colors and the four color theorem would be false. And that would be really weird for no one to have noticed that in over a century. Um, so it must not work. So let me show you the argument so that you can see how this Euler formula tells us that you actually can't do this. And I'm putting on this, you know, five colors needed, of course, this is only one scenario where you would need five colors. You have to still rule out all sorts of more complicated maps like the Martin Gardner April Fool's one, right? So this is not gonna get anywhere near proving the four color theorem, but it, it gives a little bit of an idea of how you approach these questions. So in this case, we would have five countries and each of them has to touch the other four. So that means each one has four edges which could be any sort of shape, but just, you know, for a framework, I'm going to um, write them, you know, sort of draw them up here as squares, just so we have a visual. For reference sake, I will call the countries A, B, C, D, and G. So five faces, each of them has four edges. We're trying to figure out how to stick them together. Um, so it's a little bit trickier because we don't know exactly how they're going to go together, but I actually want now to look at the vertices and think about how many vertices there could be. There are multiple possibilities because you could imagine sticking three squares together at a vertex or sticking four squares together at a vertex, or if you don't mind things getting really wobbly, five, six, whatever, right? We know that at each vertex, you need to have at least three different faces. The total number of vertices that we have to work with here is 
four times the five quadrilaterals. So we've got 20 vertices. So what that means is if you sort of put them together in the smallest possible packets of three, we can just get six vertices out of this and then we don't have enough left to give our map a seventh vertex. So the number of vertices in our map has to be six or fewer. So we know that V is less than or equal to six. And once we have that, if you think about the possibilities for a V minus E plus F, the V plus F part has to be 11 or less. So if we're gonna end up with two, the number that we're subtracting can't be any bigger than nine. Right? If E is bigger than nine, then you're guaranteed to have a difference that's strictly less than two. So that tells us that the number of edges is less than or equal to nine. We're trying to get all of the countries to touch each other. So um, A has to border B, C, D, and G. So that's four edges right there. Um, and then that's taking care of A. So all of those edges are counted. B, in addition to its edge with A, also has to border C, D, and G. So there are three more edges. C has to border D and G, so there are two more edges. And the reason I stop there is because if you add those up, you realize, oh shoot, we're already at nine. There's no room for any more edges. So what that means is it is not possible to have D also border G. So what this is telling us is there is no map with five regions, each of which touches all the others. What's gonna come next is I wanna show you an actual physical object. This is a crocheted object that I have here. Um, and until I you know, sort of circulated around a little bit, it might be a bit hard to tell um, what we're looking at here, but um, there are uh, seven colors here. Um, so they're basically sort of like the standard rainbow set if you're not one of those people who insist that indigo is a different color. So it's um, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, and white. Um, and the pieces are hexagons, huh? So that means that each piece um, should be touching six other pieces. Well, there's six different pieces. Let's see, the white, you can see it's, it's, it's touching the rainbow. In fact, sort of in cyclical order, almost like I made it that way on purpose, um, right? So white touches the other six colors out of the seven. And um, I don't know, let's say, let's take orange, if we sort of manipulate this around so that we can move orange. Orange, um, yeah, I know, if you flatten that out, orange seems to cover, seems to, seems to touch all the other colors. Um, and uh, I, I won't waste your time with doing all of it, but um, hopefully it will seem at least plausible from the fact that these do kind of look like they're identical granny hexagons. Um, that every one of these seven colors touches all the others, which is a little confusing because that's supposed to be impossible, right? And maybe it's not super obvious that it's impossible because what I actually showed was that five colors are impossible, but look at it this way. We could take three of these uh, uh, hexagons and, and recolor two of them so that they were the same color as the third and make a, a like big mega country on our map. And then we would have five colors, each of which touch all the others. And so there's something going on there. And what's going on there is there's a really important asterisk to everything that I've said so far. And the reason why we can get away with this here is because of a very important feature of this, which is, you may remember we were talking about maps on a plane or a sphere. Um, and in fact, if you, want, if you want a closer look at this now, here is the, the little tetrahedron thing that I had before. This, as I'd said, if you, if you puff it out, right, you can see that the shape here is basically a sphere, right? That is not the case with this. In fact, this, because of what the regular hexagons do, the shape is sort of weird and bizarre and kind of likes to fold up into an equilateral triangle, which is um, something that you can read about elsewhere. This has this thing where you can stick your hand through it and it sits around it like it, it's sort of uh, donut shaped. Or if you're a mathematician, it, it turns out it's, it's a torus. Right? This is not a spherical surface. And the key is that everything that I've said so far, including the four color theorem, only applies if you are looking at maps on a plane or on a sphere. If you are looking on a more complicated surface like a torus, more colors may be needed, as many as seven. This shows that there is no map with five regions, each of which touches all of the others on a sphere or on a plane. You can do it either way, since we were just looking at, you know, like little crocheted lumps, I kind of figured this. The V minus E plus F equals two works for the plane or the sphere. It does not work for the torus. The more general fact is given a particular surface, 
you can compute what V minus E plus F is. And as long as you make sure that each of the faces can be laid flat in a plane, if you sort of stretch it out and bend out any curvature, um, then the number will never change and it will depend on your surface. So for the plane or sphere, that number, which is called the Euler characteristic and commonly denoted by the Greek letter chi for characteristic, is two. For the torus, it isn't. And so if you want to see what is, is on the torus, one way to do this is to use the fact that there's a nice way to dissect a torus so that you can lay it flat, which is actually sort of the reverse of the way that most people look at this. Most of people look at this as a way of making a square into a torus, but I, I want to kind of look at this more the other way so that we can make sure that we have the right kind of, of map here, right? So I want a very simple map on the, on the torus. The torus is in the upper left, and you'll see one of them is, or both of them are sort of interrupted in the back. So they sort of go back to the dotted part, but there is a blue circle around the torus and a red circle around the torus. So each of those are going to be a single edge in our map and they intersect at one point. That's going to be a vertex. That will be the vertex in our map. The question is sort of what's left other than the edge and the vertex if you take this apart. So that's why in this diagram, we go ahead and we cut along the red circle. And if you cut along the red circle, you can take what used to be the surface of this donut and straighten it out so that you end up getting a cylinder. And then you can slit that cylinder along what used to be the blue circle, but since you cut it, it's now a blue line segment and you get this square. If you do this, you see that the face that we have is actually now something that can be laid flat. So the map that we start started with, what are the stats? Well, we've got the one face, we've got two edges, the blue one and the red one, and we've got one vertex, the point where the blue and the red meet. And so if you do the Euler characteristic calculation with that, um, then you find that V minus E plus F is one minus two plus one, you get zero. So the Euler characteristic of the torus is zero. You can also think about two-hold tori and three-hold tori, another one of those weird plurals, tori is the plural of torus. Um, and there was actually a way to compute the Euler character characteristic for that. The formula is actually fairly straightforward. Um, for a torus with G holes through it, the formula ends up being two minus two G. So basically every time you add a hole, your characteristic, Euler characteristic goes down by two. And you can actually start that with a sphere. A sphere has Euler characteristic two. If you punch a hole through it to get a torus, you get Euler characteristic zero and so forth. Let's look at the V minus E plus F for the crocheted hexagon thing that I showed you. So that was seven hexagons crocheted together. And now we can do the same sort of calculation that we did with the triangles and the quadrilaterals. The total number of edges in all the hexagons is going to be seven times the six edges for each of them. So we're going to get 42, but each edge is shared by two hexagon edges. So we need to divide that by two. There are going to be a total of 21 edges. That's definitely much easier to compute than to count. It turns out, and you can kind of see that in the flat diagram. You can also see that if you manipulate the crocheted object, that there are three hexagons at each vertex. So the total number of vertices is the number of vertices of each of the hexagons divided by three. So you get 14 vertices. And so when you compute the Euler characteristic, you get that V minus E plus F is 14 minus 21 plus seven. So you get zero and you go, oh, good. Because that confirms what we saw with the crocheted object. We do indeed get a torus. Now I will say there's a certain elegance to this model, but it's not the easiest one to see. Fortunately, people have made lots of different renditions of seven color tori, lots of them. I've been collecting them for a while. Here are some examples. I could easily talk about this stuff for three hours if you didn't stop me, but you will. So I'm going to put this up here for the moment, allow you to admire them and suggest that you might want to um, ask me about them in the uh, question and answer period. Uh, as I said, I have that web page. Um, I will be sure you know, before all of this is over that the link goes into the chat. So instead of talking about these, I would like to move on and say, actually it turns out Haywood looked at this, right? So if you remember back in the history, the four color theorem or the four color theorem was proposed as a conjecture and then Kemp proved it and it took 11 years for Haywood to go, yeah, no, sorry, that doesn't quite work. But that's not all that Haywood did. Haywood said, 
hey, um, why don't we look at other surfaces? What happens if you look at a torus or a two-hole torus or a three-hole torus? And remarkably enough, he actually found a formula that tells you the number of colors you need for any number of holes in your torus. That's Haywood's formula. The symbol that might be the least familiar, um, probably more familiar if you're a computer scientist, although notations may vary, the brackets on the outside with only the bottom, that's the floor function, um, because the stuff inside is clearly not an integer. So if you've got G holes in your torus, you take seven plus the square root of one plus 48 G, because of course you do. And then you divide that by two, and then you round down to the nearest integer. So not only did Haywood find this formula, right? He conjectured it, but he actually proved half of the conjecture. And the weird part is the part he proved is the part that's really hard for the plane. It turns out to be easy enough to prove that this number of colors is enough that Haywood did it in 1890. And it actually took much longer before people systematically proved that this also is the number of colors that you need by presenting maps like the one that we were looking at in crochet. Although that was still before the four color theorem, the, the first computer proof, even before the uncorrected version. Well, now, of course, if you have this formula, you, you wanna ask, well, what if we put more holes in our torus? And so, for example, if you take a two hole torus, which is often called a double torus, and you plug in G and you take the square root and you divide and you floor, it turns out that the number that you get is eight. So on a two hole torus, um, you are able to come up with maps that require eight colors. Maybe you could even get eight regions, each of which touch all of the others. If we want eight regions, each of which touch all of the others, each of them has to have seven edges for the other things that you're connecting them to. So we've got eight heptagons. Uh, we can count the number of edges because there are always two heptagons at each edge. So it's gonna be half the total number of edges in all the heptagons. When you simplify that, you find that there are 28 edges. And now we don't know how the vertices go together, but we know that we're looking at a genus two surface. And our formula tells us that for a genus two surface, the Euler characteristic is two minus four, which is negative two. We can figure out how many vertices they're supposed to be. And the answer ends up being, if you solve for V, that the number of vertices would need to be 18. Now, the total number of separate vertices in each of the heptagons that you have is 56. If you tried to arrange them three to a corner, you end up with a little bit of sort of extra because three times 18 is 54. You've sort of got two left over. What do you do with them? Well, what I recommend you do, because it's sort of the most symmetric resolution of this is, hey, if we had two vertices where we stuck in an extra heptagon, then that would work. We would need to have two vertices with four heptagons around them. And there are eight total heptagons nod, nod, wink, wink, maybe that would work. Um, and in fact, it turns out it does. This is um, something that I did a long time ago when I first decided I really wanted to try and do a um, you know more uh, in-depth map coloring. I started off with two clusters of four heptagons each, and then there's a long process to sort of figure out how they connect. I'm not gonna show you that because I don't have time, but for Bridges 2020, which was an online math art conference because of the pandemic. Um, I recorded a little presentation. I'll make sure that the link for that goes up as well. Um, and in that, I say a little bit about how this process worked out. Um, I managed to come up with this coloring. Um, and at the time, what I did was I sort of used that and morphed it into something else, sort of like, you know, the scarves and bracelets and, and so forth that were in the picture for the seven color uh, Taurus uh, uh, maps. But, um, for Bridges 2020, which is why I did this presentation, um, I actually worked out that you can also do this in crochet. As it happens, I made a version and then that turned out to be a little bit small to manipulate. So that's the one I'm going to show you for the moment because it fits under the camera a little bit better, but I have the big one as well. So we can maybe look at that during the um, question and answer. This is seven heptagons that are fastened in this complicated twisty way that I'm still kind of surprised works. Um, and part of what's really fun about it is um, if you make this, um, you find that the holes are, are actually sort of at close to right angles to each other. I mean, everything's floppy, so there are no exact angles in here. But that was sort of a really fun surprise in this. Um, so each one of these um, has, you can see these two clusters of four. So they've got one right angle um, corner in them. So these are not regular heptagons. And the other 
uh, all of the other vertices have three heptagons around each. Um, and so you can take this and you can also manipulate it in various ways to see some of the more hidden corners. So you get this really cool thing that's fun to manipulate it. Um, my Bridges paper actually, in addition to this, um, also includes a crochet pattern for this um, that's just up in the Bridges archive. So if you are interested in making this and you crochet, um, look at that pattern. Um, excitingly, as of I think last week, um, someone actually has successfully made the made it like the whole thing and sewn it together, um, which is the hard part. I have step by step instructions for how you assemble this beast. Th by the way, this the crocheted thing, my name for it because they are granny polygons, um, so called because they are similar to traditional crochet granny squares uh, is granny's double torus. But I didn't make Granny's Double Taurus until 2020. I worked out this design 10 years before. And the reason that I did that was because I wanted to make this other thing. So you can take this pattern and rework it in a way that, again, I'm just sort of going to put it up here. If you want to understand it better, I would recommend look at the paper, look at the video, ask me lots of questions during the question and answer period. But each one of these clusters, you can see it as being a torus with a puncture in it. And you're taking these two single tori and gluing them together to get a double torus. And if you tease that apart a little bit, you can actually understand this as two double tori glued around a puncture with a very specific color arrangement around that puncture. That's the thing that's pictured at the bottom. I wanted to see if I could find a way to make an eight color map on this painted, uh, or on, on this uh, uh, ceramic tea set. This is literally from one of those paint your own pottery places you may have seen, you know, where like kids go in and like paint plates and piggy banks and stuff. Um, they had this, it had two handles. I went, I have to do this. I have to figure out how to do this in a sensible way um, so that I don't break my brain. And so I came up with this arrangement. And then that picture that you see at the bottom is basically what I did at the rim where the two come together. So the puncture is literally the mouth of the mug at the bottom. What I did was literally, it's there are like 16 color junctions because it's the four colors on the top and the four colors on the bottom in all possible combinations. So I divided that circle into 16 segments and then did the right color arrangement and just made them connect on the top and the bottom in the way that seemed the most aesthetically appealing. I also, because of course I am, um, am wearing, um, the jewelry set that I put together that has these as well. So this is another version of both of these concepts. The pendant here is a seven color torus. So this is a map um, of the type that we've seen before, seven colors, they all touch each other, um, but ornamental and pretty because otherwise it's not as much fun to wear. And what I have on my wrist, it's a little bit more subtle because it's sort of the holes go around the back and are fastened together, but this is a double torus and using the same mechanism as the T set, um, this is an eight color map on it. So all of these eight colors touch each other. Um, and of course it would not be complete without the plane. So I've got the four color earrings. Thank you, Susan. That was uh, very cool and very clear. One of the links that I wanted to make sure that everyone had access to. So Moira Chas has made a ton of really amazingly beautiful crocheted things. I just put up one of the seven color tori. She has a page with a bunch of tori and double tori. And um, I don't remember she has the triple tori and higher posted yet. Um, but some really, really great crochet examples of everything. Um, she also, um, I, I think, you can let me know if this is true, I think she might be the first person, at least that I know of, who um, sewed together six crocheted hexagons. Um, I didn't actually realize it at the time that I made this, which is really ironic because it was literally like an article that I'd seen before, but somehow that bit washed over me. But um, Ellie Baker was kind enough to sort of go, yeah, Myra did one of those. And I was like, oh, and so she has one. It's not granny motifs, but it's um, single crochet, same, same sort of premise. Looks like we have three questions queued up in the q and if, if you can see them there. Well, some of these are easy. Can I tell you about the end color problem on an umbilic torus? No. Uh, no, no, I actually don't. I, I, if anyone here can say anything about the end color problem on an umbilic torus, uh, please, please do let me know. I have no idea if there are any implications there. Um, now, extensions of the map theorem to higher dimensions, I am not sure about that, but I will tell you there is definitely an extension of, there, there is, and there may also be people here who know, who know more about this than I do. There is an extension of 
Um, so Euler's formula is sometimes presented, the spherical version as a formula for polyhedra, right? You can think of it as if you have a convex polyhedron and you do vertices minus edges plus faces, you're always going to get two. Um, so a polyhedron, if you count the interior, it's, it's three-dimensional. So you could argue that you're kind of missing something that, that you really should count the solid itself as there's one of it. And if you do that, you would have vertices minus edges plus faces, the signs alternate, so it would be minus solids. And if you do that, then the answer that you're gonna get is one, right? Because it's one less than two. So if you instead pass to convex polytopes, so convex four-dimensional hypersolids, convex five-dimensional hypersolids and so forth, and you take the alternating sum of how many components there are of each dimension, um, you always get plus or minus one. I think the sign alternates, it's been a really long time. Um, I happen to know this because of a project from the summer when I was in high school. So it's, it's, it's been a while. Um, but yeah, so I know that in that case, there are higher dimensional generalizations. So I would be shocked if there wasn't a higher dimensional notion of like Euler characteristic for you know, higher dimensional manifolds. I don't happen to know anything about it, but it feels like something that probably, you know, ties to, you know, advanced topology in ways that make sense. So any, any, any actual practicing topologists, I'm, I'm just, I'm a fake topologist. I just love looking at these things, but I don't have extensive training in there. Um, surfaces other than with simple holes. Um, I guess I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure what that would necessarily be. So part of it is if you're just looking at surfaces without any edges, right? So like not, not a torus with a puncture in it um, or not a, a piece of a plane without edges. Um, there's a classification that says, so they come in two kinds. They come, uh, they're surfaces that are orientable, which are the ones that we've been looking at. And then there are surfaces that aren't orientable that are like the Mobius strip. Um, so, non-orientable surfaces don't separate into a top side and a bottom side. There's a classification that says, um, and I may not have all the right modifiers here, but that the only possible, like topologically, so if you're allowed to stretch things, you know, um, you're just kind of looking at the, the topological form. Um, the only possible orientable closed surfaces without edges are the G-hold tori. So the only other things that you're going to get are these non-orientable surfaces like a Mobius band or a Klein bottle and so forth. Mobius band has an edge, Klein bottle doesn't. And for what it's worth, Haywood's formula works for all of those almost. The one exception is it breaks down for the Klein bottle. But my understanding is it works for everything else. I think that basically the surfaces that we would be looking at here would be surfaces um, you know, that are just and hold tori um, or non-orientable surfaces. There's a classification of those. I know less about it, but you know, it's I think all sort of adding together um, different simpler surfaces. Um, and so I think that's fully understood. It's just more complicated and harder to talk about. Um, that being said, there are some really nice maps on non-orientable surfaces. In particular, if anyone was wondering, well, gee, you can do seven hexagons. What about six pentagons? You, you might want to ask me that. It's possible that there's something interesting there. Um, I am not sure what two pyromats on a torus are. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, but the question is, have you or anyone done art using two pyromats on a torus? And um, maybe you can, uh, if, 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 if there's a more of an explanation for that, I might be able to recognize um, what that is, but I guess it's going to be a little bit like the umbilic torus. Um, I don't know. Um, does it mean anything to consider maps with non-integer dimensions? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, but but you know, very much on that. I, I I have no idea. I'm not I'm not sure what the question would be. Um, but. It, it, it sounds kind of fun. Ah, yes, okay. So Colin does point out, um, technically speaking, by what I've described, there are two solids inside and outside, so you would get zero. Um, sure, um, that's not the way that this particular formula was constructed. Um, and so, like, I'm not sure that it necessarily makes 
everything sensible, but the, the pattern that actually does hold is that if you add or subtract one for the object itself of the full dimension, um, depending on whether that dimension is even or odd, then you always get plus or minus one. Um, and there may be some other formulation and maybe you even know about it, Colin, I don't know, but that, that has, um, uh, ha has it come out to zero. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, the, the formula that I was looking at was this generalization of, it wasn't talking about the more complicated Euler characteristics. It was just a generalization of the convex polyhedron Euler formula, right? Which in this context is looking at the surface of a sphere. Um, but yeah, if you have that plus or minus one at the end. So basically what it means is if you do the sum more like what we did without that last thing, it ends up alternating between does it end up, I think it ends up alternating between zero and two. I don't remember. I leave that as an exercise because that's probably not that hard to figure out. Um, oh, right, yeah, so how many uh, colors are needed on non-orientable surfaces? Yeah, so other than the Klein bottle, um, as I said, the Haywood formula actually does cover everything else. The Klein bottle, I don't remember what the deal is. I, I can't remember now if the Haywood formula predicts more colors than you actually need or fewer. So um, the, uh, thank you, sorry. I was scrolling down to see if anyone had, had responded to something else and someone said publish and I have, um, <laughs> which is why I was saying, yeah, you should take a look at my Bridges paper. Um, I, I haven't published sort of, you know, all of this stuff together, but um, I have published, um, there are also some other links that, uh, and one of the things that I can do too is try and make sure that even if we don't necessarily get everything um, out into the chat now that when this is edited and posted on YouTube, like we have all of the fun bells and whistles. But um, Moira Chas wrote a really nice column, feature column for the AMS um, that, I mean, it, it was a while ago now, so it's, it sort of doesn't necessarily have the bleeding edge of this, but it was after I had published the first double Taurus paper. So she actually has a really nice um, kind of like double Taurus version or double Taurus crocheted version of the T set um, and a lot of other things. It's a really nice article. So that has a lot of the lay of the land here. Um, I have two Bridges papers and the one from this year, which is the one that also has the video talk, goes through the seven heptagons in detail. So that's published in the Bridges proceedings. Both of them are actually um, one this year. And the previous one was before I made this bracelet form, I did this double Taurus as a pendant. Um, and the paper was about constructing that pendant. For the non-orientable surfaces, um, I am actually not sure of, of whether Haywood was actively considering them when he proved things. And the other thing that I couldn't remember be, and then I got distracted was, I don't remember whether the Klein bottle needs fewer or more colors than the prediction. The Klein bottle, if I remember correctly, needs the same number as a Mobius strip does, which I think is six. Okay, I'm having this. I, I think maybe I should say I, I leave it as an exercise to the audience to go look that up on Google to make sure I don't get that wrong. But here's a fun fact. Um, so let's say you wanted to do six pentagons and you wanted to have six pentagons so that each of them touched all the others. Well, here's a really sort of weird way to do that. You could take a dodecahedron, right? So this regular solid 12 faces, so too many pentagons. I do agree, but but exactly twice too many pentagons. So that's sort of interesting. So you take a dodecahedron and a dodecahedron topologically is a sphere. It's just like a sphere. So what you could do is something that people sometimes do with a sphere. You could glue together antipodal points. You could glue together everything that's opposite each other through the center of the icosahedron. And if you do that, then you should end up with half as many pentagons as you started with. You would end up with um, uh, six pentagons. And if you have played with the topology enough, you will know that the result of taking a sphere and gluing together antipodal points is the projective plane. And so you come up with something that is like the projective plane. So you can't actually literally fully make it because it passes through itself. But as long as you leave some gaps in the seams, um, you can actually sew this. So this is um, five fleece. Um, this is before I'd had the idea of making them out of um, uh, uh, crochet. So at some point on my list is, oh, I should crochet some granny pentagon so that I can have the complete set. Um, but uh, here there's bits of the edges that I didn't sew together because you can't do it without passing it through itself. But um, this is um, six fleece pentagons all sewn together and you get the projective plane, which is a non-orientable surface. So this has only one edge. Um, 
I would highly recommend that if you sew at all and can get your hands on some fleece and have the patience to cut out regular pentagons, which I'm not sure I do anymore, but I did back when I made this, you should make one of these because they are so fun to handle. I can't even tell you. Um, it, part of it is if you've ever played with one of these sort of fabric projective planes, this is an example of a Fortunatus's purse. There's a book chapter on that too. So if you look that up, you can find that. Um, a lot of cross references here because lots of people do really cool math art stuff. So if you're not familiar with this, in addition to you should go look up my seven color Taurus page and look up all the people who made things on that. You should also look up the fiber arts books that Carolyn Yackel and Sarah Mabel Castro co-edited. Um, they had made a couple of the, the um, seven color Taurus maps that I showed on that slide. Um, one of the books has a chapter on Fortunatus's purse in it. Um, and it leaves this as a challenge, so it doesn't give you a pattern. But if you do this, it, the thing that's maddening about this is if you manipulate it, it's always just about to flatten out. It's, uh, it really is. And it's very soft, so you kind of want to manipulate it until you sort of find yourself turning it around and around and going, no, really, it's just, if I go a little bit farther, it's going to flatten out <laughs> because the angles are very shallow. Um, and so it's, it's very rounded and it really feels like it wants to be flat, but it's twisted in a way that it can't. So that's, um, that's one example of a non-orientable map. Um, and this turns out to be the optimal number for the projective plane, it is um, uh, six. You can rewrite the Haywood formula in terms of the Euler characteristic instead of the genus, right? And so that's the easier way to apply it to, to non-orientable surfaces. True pi or map, yes, here's the thing, you can't do that. Because if you allow, if you allow maps where you allow countries to be disconnected, you can actually show basically with Haywood's formula that you can construct maps that require arbitrarily many colors. And the reason is, if you're allowed to have countries where, actually, I guess I should be careful because the thing where each country has two separate regions, I think that that's enough. I know that if you allow it to have any number of, of extra regions, then you're definitely, there's no way you can do it. Um, but I think two extra regions might be enough because what that allows you to do is to make things that are really secretly gluing diagrams for high genus maps, right? So you sort of, you make this country, but really secretly what it is, is it's instructions to glue together something complicated so that it's equivalent to doing a map on a high genus surface. And so I suspect that that's going to be at least somewhat true for two pyre maps. So I guess my answer is still, I don't know, but I've got a slightly better idea about it. Um, and my suspicion is that will be enough that you can do things like make maps that if you try to turn them into maps where all the countries are connected, you would have to glue them together in a way that you're secretly doing a map on like a triple torus. Oh, uh, Maura, six is for the, the Klein bottle, I assume? Um, which is what I thought I remembered. Because the Mobius strip is six, um, which makes sense because the projective, basically a Mobius strip, you can also look at it as a punctured projective plane. So this, right, I say it's a projective plane, but technically because of the hole, it's a Mobius strip, right? Um, and, and, and so it's the same, you know, similar sort of principle, yeah. Um, empire map, oh, <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. So the, the comment is that the two pyre maps come from the fact that these maps with multiple regions were called empire maps, which makes sense, right? Like you, you color an entire empire the same, culture, uh, same color and an empire may be you know, disconnected regions um, that are controlled by a central government, right? And so capital empire got reversed engineered and so two pyre is, it. that's really cute. So you can have three pyre and four, that's, that's adorable. Actually, thank, I'm very happy I learned that. That's really super fun. Um, so I don't know, but that's what I suspect. Um, now I might actually go and think about it because that seems like a fun puzzle to think about. Andy Lotto points out 12 colors are needed for a two pyre map on a sphere. Oh, there we go. Um, but only 12. Yeah. I mean, 12 colors are, so in, in other words, are 12 colors also sufficient? I don't know. Um, I mean, I guess I, 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 I was sort of I asking that so out. otherwise, why, why 12, but yeah. Um, but um, yeah, right. Well, but I mean, it could just be that 12 is what they've shown, but yeah. Um, yeah, so so this is, this is part of the reason why I'm sort of like, yeah, now I kind of want to think about that, which may mean looking it up because it, it, I'm going to 
guess that that's yes 12 is sufficient oh nice oh excellent it's a different it's another uh, uh ams thing which I, I i would make a point of snagging the link except i know it will be available eventually so i i can get it later thank you that's very cool 12 is sufficient so i'm assuming then that what that must mean is that the that the fact that you're only allowing two pyres so you're only allowed two two disconnected pieces puts a limit on how complicated, how topologically complicated you can make your scenario. Um, I should also say too, I'm not 100% sure that there is a sensible way to interpret every empire map as a conventional map on some weird surface. But I know that among the empire maps are ones where you can do something where covertly it's like, well, I'm making you glue these things together and these things together and these things together. So really it's a double torus. Uh -huh. I think uh, we should probably think about wrapping up now. Are there any, um, I think you've probably hit all the questions in the Q&A, is that, is that correct? Oh, uh, I, I'm sorry, just to add for people who are, are not looking at that. Um, so Mario Cha said that he would only consider orientable surfaces. So that was all added on afterwards, um, which, which that makes a lot of sense to me. So that's, you know, besides the fact that I didn't know, I kind of felt like maybe that would be it. Um, yeah, um, we, we should talk sometime because you know a lot of stuff that I don't. So I, I want to learn more about all of the fun details here. Thank you again. That was absolutely wonderful. And um, thank you. Bye-bye.